story. I don't believe it. Mm -hmm. I've, mm -hmm. You know, I've never been to Maine. I'm, Maine's my right? only state. I got 49 out of 50. Maine is my 50th. I don't believe they have Rams in Maine. Are you yeah. kidding me? You don't you don't think there's Rams in Bangor, Maine? You don't think there's no. Rams in Freeport, Maine, and Kennebunkport? No. Well, how would you no, know? You haven't been there. There's bushes. There are there's Rams bushes there. in Maine. There's Rams uh. there. Rams all over the place, raining from the sky. <laughs> Welcome to PTI, yeah. boys and girls. In today's episode, the Reds are hot. Draymond has a decision, and Victor Wembanyama has arrived. But we begin today with Miami's Luisa Rise going five for five last night to raise his batting average back to 400. Marlins have played 73 games. That's almost half the season. Will on a rise at 400. Big deal, little deal, or no deal? Well, Tony, I don't believe it's a big deal yet. It's impressive. It's impressive. He's worth following. I mean, this is a cool development as we move, you know, a little closer to the halfway point of the Major League Baseball season. Very cool. Because let's face it, people just been trying to hit bombs the last 10 years. I mean, you know, I know they're expecting for a league-wide batting average to go up a little bit this year. It might be a trace up, but it's not like it was in the aughts where people did hit 360 and 370. Now the, the difference between him and the next person is like 75 points because people just want to hit the long ball, dude. So it's impressive. Put the ball in play. That's what he's trying to yeah. do. He finds value in that, and I find as a sort of a baseball, I'm not going to say purist, but a traditionalist, I find value in that. So I'm impressed, but I'm not going to say it's a big deal. Not yet. It's too early, Tone. We're about uh, 10 days away from this being a big deal. Because if you're batting 400 on July 1st, then that merits attention. You know, I don't think anybody's going to ever hit 400 again because of relief pitching. But this right. guy, this guy's career average after five years in the bigs is 327. He was the... He was the AL batting champ last year. You got to tell me why the Twins traded him. I, mean, I don't understand that. This guy can put the ball in play. The entire reason to have no defensive shifts is so people like Arise can put the ball in play, can get on first base. You know, you can't hit a three-run home run if there's nobody on first base. That's right. So he's the hitter. He's the kind of hitter I would like to see. And by the way, his team, the Marlins, they're one of the big surprises of the league. They're a playoff team right now. They're 11 games over 500. I believe they're 18 and 5 in one run games. And, in, and they're not hitting home runs. Ty Cobb didn't hit home runs, Mike. This is what no. baseball wants. They want people on base because it's more exciting. Exactly what well, you want and exactly Tony, what I want. Yes, then, then that would be great. Then he, you wouldn't have to ban the shift if there were more guys like him. Because he can hit That's them right. where they ain't. Nobody under 90 That's understands right. that phrase anymore. But he believes in that. He knows he can put the ball in play, not just put it in play, but where he wants to. A great percentage of the time, which means around 30% or more. So good. There need to be more That's guys like you That's what Rod Carew did. Yes. No, but analytics have, Rod have, have did. made him extinct. Tony Gwynn did that too. They did. Yes. And now we don't yes. have enough guys like him. So I'm impressed. The once lowly Reds are suddenly atop the National League Central. Cincinnati beat Colorado for its ninth win in a row last night. The highlight was Joey Votto hitting a home run in his return to the lineup 10 months after surgery on his left biceps and rotator cuff. The Reds only won 62 games all of last season. Now they got 38. Tony, does it feel to you like something special is happening in Cincinnati? So for the last three or four years on this show, the only time Cincinnati was mentioned was in the context of Joe Burrow. Nobody has talked yeah, about the Reds in right. a long time. Right? I don't think the Reds have won a playoff series since the 90s. I think the last time they got into the playoffs once in the last 10 years was the COVID year when 16 teams got in. Like, I, I don't want to get carried away with this. But I right. will tell you that what the Reds are doing this year with young players like Ella De La Cruz and, and people like that that I watched on tape today when it was sent to me, they remind me of the Orioles from last year. They got a young manager that they stuck with even through a lot of losses. They got a lot of people coming up the chain from the farm and they're yeah. winning, a, you know, they're winning a, not an enormous amount of games. That may be in the years to come. But, I, you know, Mike, People who follow sports know in the National League, the two best places 
for baseball are Cincinnati and St. Louis. Baseball players are revered there. It's good for baseball when Cincinnati's good. I don't know if yeah. they're good yet, but it's good for baseball when they are. Yeah, I hope they're not too good because my team plays in that division. But you mentioned Ellie De La Cruz, Matt McClain. I mean, they've got, Tony, teams have d done this. The blueprint's out there. Cleveland did yeah. it and got close, didn't cash in fully. The Cubs did it and cashed in once. Houston's done it, cashed in multiple yep. times. And so this yep. is the way you can do this. You don't have to, like in the NBA, try to get a super team with three people. You draft well, you develop even more so, and you let the young yeah. stars come up. And De La Cruz, who grew like four inches since COVID, is – Tony, talk yeah. about shortstops. We talked about this Jeez. yesterday with San Diego and shortstops. Cincinnati's got multiple guys, and now they can reposition Good. them but still have great players. Good. So development, how about that? Who knew? Let's move to the NBA Hot Stove League. Draymond Green opted out of his contract with the Warriors yesterday and is an unrestricted free agent. But the new general manager of the Warriors, Mike Dunleavy Jr., said, and I'm quoting here, we really want Draymond back. We feel like we have to have him, unquote. Wilbon, do you agree? Tony, I don't necessarily agree that they have to. I mean, I think that that organization, and I know – that Mike Dunleavy's coming in and trying to fill some pretty big shoes left by Bob Myers, who, who, who left. I don't know that you have to. Draymond, I'm not, and I'm not about to try to diminish the value of Draymond Green, which is great. And it's great, greatest with, with Golden State. It could be great somewhere else if they traded him. If he's signed, he's a free agent now. If he signed and played with LeBron, what? Draymond wouldn't have great value. He wouldn't have great value in Phoenix. If there was a trade and he landed there and he played with Kevin Durant again and, and Booker, I, I, you know, and Bradley Beal, of course there would be. I think that Golden State feels that's the best path forward for them one or two more times if this window is still open. I don't know that it's the only way to go, but it may be still the best way to go. It's a good phrase if this window is still open. Uh, I, you know, I'm not... I'm not sure there's another act there. Me, personally, I, I don't know that. Right. Things end. Right. Okay? Dynasties end. Television shows end. Department stores go out of business. Draymond is 33. Clay Thompson is 33. Steph Curry is 35. I, don't, I think it's harder than just saying we're going to run it back again. You know, they may need Draymond Green, Mike, but you and I would agree they need other things as well. Yes. And what happens, do. ultimately... As you age, you know, you saw this with the Spurs when Parker and Ginobili and Duncan got old and Kawhi Leonard kept them afloat for a couple of years, but they sank. Everybody's going to sink. And at some point, Draymond Green, who I like very much, is going to become the hood ornament on the car because he's not the engine anymore. Because, you know, because things change. Uh, yeah, and, and you get old. I don't see how they can keep Draymond Green and Jordan Poole. I don't see how you can do I that, see, and I think Dudley Tony, has said that. That's the question. You know, I don't see I don't, that either. I mean, well, I, I listen to players who've spent their entire lives in locker rooms, so 12, 15 years or more, and almost to a man, they say the, the locker room can't function this way. You're not going to win yeah. at the highest level, their level, the level they got accustomed Let me just to gonna, I wanna, with this dynamic. I want to put something in your ear. I want to put What's this that? in your ear. There are reports that Draymond Green is in France with yeah. LeBron James. Yeah. Let's take yeah. a break. But coming up, did yeah. Isaiah Thomas, your boy, have something yeah. to do with the Suns trading Chris Paul, your other boy? Yeah. We're yeah. going to ask Brian Windhorst. Good. Let's ask Windhorst. We'll also ask him whether the Pelicans plan to move on from Zion. Yeah, Draymond yeah, that, in that's France the whole with point. LeBron. Are you going to keep him in pool? I mean, if Steve Kerr's... We have NBA Hot Stove to discuss ahead of Thursday's draft, so let us welcome in our great friend Brian Windhorst. Brian, let's start with this. Chris Paul told the New York Times that the Suns traded him because the owner, Matt Ishbia, and Isaiah Thomas, and I emphasize that name, Isaiah Thomas, wanted to go in a different direction. What role exactly is Isaiah Thomas going to play with the Suns? 
Well, he is sort of an unofficial advisor. In fact, if you remember that when uh, when Matt Ishbia got in that little tete a tete with uh, Nikola Jokic, Isaiah was sitting right next to him. It was it was Isaiah Thomas, Matt Ishbia, and Nikola Jokic all involved in that, and so he's been very close to Ishbia for a while. And but I the reason I'm smiling here is, look, I don't know exactly what Chris Paul was doing. But I think this was a little tweak because Isaiah has sort of been an unnamed, uh, you know, you know, role player in the Suns' operation since Ishbia bought the team, and him little dropping that in there. In fact, he mentioned it several times in the interview um, that he did with the New York Times. I think it was just a little like, okay, you're going to trade me. Well, I'm going to give you that going out the door. You can deal with the fallout from me talking about how Isaiah is making decisions. I think Isaiah advised on it, but I think that it was still made with Josh Bartlestein, the CEO, and the son of Bradley Beal's agent, uh, James Jones, the president, and Matt Ishbia <laughs> were, uh, were the driving forces in there. Oh, I'm happy to stay out of that one, Brian. We'll stay with the sons, though, <laughs> and let's deal with DeAndre Ayton. Um, I cannot imagine that the sons will have DeAndre Ayton for very long, certainly not into the season, but not even long this week. What do you think is going to happen? Are there offers out there that can actually make the Suns what they think they'll be? Well, Michael, they're trying, I think, but they've been trying for a while with DeAndre Ayton. Um, he isn't an ideal fit. Uh, and also his salary is problematic. It's over $30 million a year which is a lot when your other three guys that they have now are like making over like 120 million a year uh, going forward. So they're going to try, they're going to try to accomplish two things. One, they're going to try to break him down into a couple of different players. It wouldn't be a one for one trade. And ideally they could save money on the deal, but that's a big ass. The market for Aiton isn't enormous. So they're not going to make a trade that is dis disadvantageous to them. So, um, I do think it's not impossible that they could try to keep him through the offseason and see if they could do something else later. And I will say that when Frank Vogel got this job, one of the reasons I think he impressed the Suns is that he had a plan for DeAndre Ayton. And if you look at the way that he coached when he was with the Pacers and was with the Lakers, he was very effective playing big men and using them a key defensively. Now, I'm not saying Ayton is Dwight Howard or Roy Hibbert, but I do think that, you know, that is isn't impossible that Ayton could start the season with them. Okay. I'd have gotten rid of him before last trade deadline. That's just me, personally. Let's go to Zion. What's his relationship and status and future, if there is one, with the New Orleans Pelicans, Brian? Yeah, well, I don't think it's ideal. I think it's been frustrating on both sides. Um, you know, when you talk to other folks who are involved with the team, he doesn't seem to have the relationship that you'd like a franchise player to have with his front office or his teammates. Um, that said, I don't think the organization is is ready to, to, to give up. I think that if they could have traded or can trade into either the second or third pick in Thursday's draft, I think they may be willing to part with Zion Williamson in that situation. To, I think the guy that David Griffin, the general manager, wants is Scoot Henderson, and he seems to be at least interested in kicking the tires there. I do not think that they are looking to trade Zion Williamson to anybody who calls up. I think they had a very specific reason why they started talks with the, with the Hornets and Blazers, and if they don't make a deal, I think they'll try to welcome him back. But obviously... Zion has to be on the court for the Pelicans to have much of a, a future. And the fact that they're even considering this, I think, is an indication of maybe where he is, you know, with the organization. It's very interesting. That really is. I will get you out of here on this. Victor Wembanyama has uh, arrived in New York on Monday. You know him. You've gone to see him in France. People are expecting him to win NBA titles, maybe multiple NBA titles. I know Wilbon is. He didn't even win the French League. Is this cause for concern? So you have to have to see the whole picture here. So he specifically joined a team in France that was designed just to work on his skills for the NBA. They got a whole bunch of young players so they could practice more and practice harder. They got American guards on the team who were there playing in their first year in Europe because the guys who had been had NBA experience who could work with him on the sort of the pick and roll actions that he would play in the NBA. Being successful 
uh, on the court was sort of secondary to what that team was operating this year. And with a month left to go in the season, they lost their second best player. So the fact that they were able to get to the finals against a team that was much more experienced and much more, uh, much deeper than them actually was a great accomplishment. He had a spectacular season. As for next year, look, I'm not going to sit here and predict that he's going to impact winning from day one. LeBron didn't. Durant didn't. Luka didn't. I'm not saying he's going to take the Spurs to the playoffs, but you give him a couple of years, you're going to see this guy being impactful. And I think right out of the gate, he'll be one of the most impactful defensive players because I'm telling you, nobody in the NBA has ever, currently in the NBA, has ever seen a guy who can move like this with arms this long. They're not going to believe how many shots he can get to. It's going to be a revelation for the league. Brian, I can't Thank believe you, that Tony, Thank you. Tony just ripped a kid, a 19-year-old, for getting to the finals. <laughs> really? Really, you want to go you know there what and I get did, off my Mike? lawn, old man? Mike, you know what I did? I read the question that was printed for me <laughs> that you probably <laughs> okay. wrote and didn't have the guts to ask. I did. Let's take yeah, one last break. I wanted break. you to ask it. <laughs> Still to come, the warrior god, yes, appears to be back on track. Yes. And is Aaron Judge's absence to blame for the Yankees' anemic hitting? Yeah, of course it is. You when are Von so Yama excited. Is everything, right. we're all excited. We're all everybody okay, but you've never seen actually, him. You've never excited. seen him play, have you? I've watched have you him ever on seen TV. Him play I watched person? him yesterday. I watched him this week on TV. I watched no. Kerry Russell on TV. It doesn't mean we're pals. You know. Tonight on SportsCenter at 6 Eastern, with the NBA Draft two days away, how this year's top prospects compare to established NBA stars. Plus, new comments from the Heat on offseason plans that could get Miami back to the NBA Finals. And Joe Hayden joins the show, ranking the hardest receivers to cover across the NFL. SportsCenter, tonight at 6 Eastern on ESPN. Happy time, people. Happy 28th birthday, Felix Bautista. The Orioles closer in his second year in the bigs. So far this season, Bautista is 3-1. 19 saves and 32 appearances, the third most saves in the American League. He's got 67 strikeouts, 17 walks, a whip of 0.990, an ERA of just 108. Last year, Bautista had 15 saves and a 2.19 ERA in 65 games. He is huge. 6'8", 285. Took him a while to get to the majors. The Marlins first signed him in 2012. But he is one of the reasons the Orioles are a half game behind Texas for the second best record in the American League. And they open up a two-game set tonight at Tampa, the best team in baseball. Tony, I think casual fans would be surprised to learn that most pitchers, and particularly starting pitchers, are 6'2", 6'3", 6'4", 6'5". The league is populated, baseball is, with pitchers, particularly 6'4 and 6'5, but 6'8, 280. Big. Wow. Big. I mean, that's that's power forward right there. It's big. You know, it's NFL lineman. Happy yes, anniversary, Barry Bonds. On this day, 22 years ago, Bonds hit his 38th home run of the season. That's right, his 38th. It set the record for home runs before the All Star game, and Bonds still had 17 games to go. Shohei Otani leads the majors now with 24 home runs. This was the year Bonds hit 73 homers. Now, everybody believes Bonds used performance-enhancing drugs. That's why he's not in the Hall of Fame. But in those days, Bonds was getting maybe one good pitch to hit per at bat. A lot of players took steroids. Nobody else had 38 by June 20th. What gets lost in the Bonds debate is what a truly great hitter Bonds was. Yeah, truly great hitter, great swing, great eye, all of it. And it is lost in the debate, Tone. You, you, I mean, most people of a certain age are going to feel a certain kind of way as soon as you bring up bonds and numbers, and it's, you know what, it's forever going to be that way. It just is. Happy trails to the Mountain West Conference for San Diego State. San Diego State had previously requested a one-month extension before continuing its commitment to the Mountain West. People saw this as San Diego State playing footsie with the Pac-12, considering that with the scheduled departure of USC and UCLA, the Pac-12 would have no presence in Southern California. The Mountain West responded by saying no, no exceptions, and in fact is treating the request for an extension as the school's official notice of withdrawal from the conference. San Diego State has been in the Mountain West since 1999 and is likely the best athletic school in that conference. 
This past April, they played for the NCAA Basketball Championship, and their football team has won 10 games or more five times since 2015. But Tony, you know, they, have, they, they, they don't have a brand. They don't have an identity. Okay, I went to see Kawhi Leonard play once. I specifically went there to see him play his last year in college. Tony Gwynn was there too, I guess, right? Is that Tony it? Gwynn. I mean, they, I mean Tony for Gwynn. them to replace SC and UCLA no, with all can't. the tradition can't. in California, I just... Can't, ugh. can't do it. Let's go no. to the big finish. The Let's Yankees are four and eight. They're batting a league worst 195 since Aaron Judge went out after crashing into that fence. Your thoughts? Stanton, Rizzo, Donaldson, LeMayu, they're all struggling at the same time. Somebody's got to break out of it or get him back in the lineup. Max Scherzer, your boy, beat the Strohs. Is he back to form? Warrior God, eight innings, one earned, eight strikeouts. Good for him. Give him goof. Pat Riley said a goal of his is to get his coaches back in suits and ties. And then he laughed. Do you think he was kidding? I hope not. Pat Riley's the best dressed man in sports maybe ever. I mean, they, they should go back to suits and ties, get out of those sweatsuits. I'm tired of them. Way to go, Coach Riles. Jeff Goodman reports Larry Brown, speaking of well-dressed, could join the coaching staff at the University of Washington. Does that make sense to you? Hall of Fame coach, Mike Hopkins could use him. Last one, Victor Wembanyama. We'll throw out the first pitch at the Yankee game tonight. What do you expect? 52 feet, maybe. He's never played baseball. Yeah, how, how, how many times have you even thrown a ball? We're out of time. We'll try and do better the next time. Al Serafina, happy birthday. I'm Mike Wilbon. Same time tomorrow, Knuckleheads. You can get the podcast on the app or Apple Podcast. Happy birthday, a day late, Deanna. And now, here's Sports Show. Deanna.